Today we will continue our discussion of flows and chaos in flows and so on via a discussion of two very paradigmatic examples of the Baker and the Horseshoe maps. Recall that in the last lecture we looked at some examples of coupled ordinary differential equations which come from a truncation or a simplification of the Navier-Stokes equation. The Lorentz system, which has uh, been so important in the development of this subject, the motion in the Lorentz system, as we saw, was circulatory, it was aperiodic, it was chaotic, and it was on a fractal attractor. Now, if the attractor is fractal and the motion is chaotic, such an attractor is called a strange attractor. And what we saw is that there are examples of strange attractors not just in the Lorentz system, but also we saw in the Rossler. And the Rossler, which is sort of uh, imaged over here in the upper right hand corner, the way in which the motion goes on the Rossler attractor is that it goes circulatory for a little while and then it goes up into the third dimension and then it again circulates in the x and y plane uh, and so on. Central to the formation of a strange attractor is the way in which phase space undergoes stretching and folding. We saw simple examples of that uh, in the uh, image of the taffy machine. But the way in which uh, phase space dynamics occurs in, a, in, this, in this kind of a dynamical system is that volumes get bent over and then stretched apart so that nearby points move, can move very far from each other and even though they may move closer in other directions. There are two or there are a few important models, two of which we will discuss today. Uh, and these are known respectively as the Baker transformation and the horseshoe map. So, uh, the Baker transformation uh, is a, it's a transformation of a square onto itself and uh, it loosely resembles the action of a baker as uh, he or she uh, would be kneading dough uh, so, or to make a more uh, familiar example in our context, how you, how one mixes the dough for chapatis or for to make a naan or something like that, okay. So the action of this, uh, this Baker action is the following. You start with a unit square, you stretch it out into a rectangle of half the height and twice the length so that the area is the same. Then you cut the uh, rectangle into two and put the second half of this rectangle onto the uh, first so that you get back a square. Through this transformation, you can see that the area of the square has not changed. After one transformation, you can see that the square uh, is such that those two points, let us say the two eyes of this little figure over here, which were close by in the initial, uh, in, in, as we started out. After one iteration of this, or the one, trans, uh, one application of this transformation, one eye is on the lower uh, part of the square and the other eye is on the upper part. If you do it again, you can see now that things have got stretched out in this x direction and the two eyes, so to speak, are, are at two different locations over here. You would apply it once more and now you have got a completely messed up uh, figure, but the area has remained the same. The actual uh, map itself written algebraically is the following x goes to 2x and y goes to y by 2. That was the first part of this transformation. In the second part of the transformation, we apply the mod 1 operation. So, all these points are not, no longer bigger than 1. They are taken back to this side. And you add one half 
depending on where x was. So if you just sit down with a piece of paper and work it out, you can see that this particular mapping is exactly what uh, the Baker transformation is. All right. So after a few iterations, the square is completely mixed up and this is a model which we can analyze in some more detail. So here, here is a very nice animation that I found on the net and you can see what's happening over here. You start with the uh, initial square and, after, well, let me just come back to it in a moment. You had a square which started out with one side red and one side green and one side black. And then as you keep applying it, you find that there are successively more strips of green and black until finally all the points are completely mixed up uh, and you can see that the uh, action is exactly as it was on that uh, smiley face that we started with. At each step now, the separation between points on the horizontal lines, this doubles because we are stretching out by a factor of two. And points on a vertical line, their distance decreases and in fact, it becomes a half. So points in the vertical direction come closer together and in the horizontal direction, they spread far apart. Now, we can actually do much more with this particular map. Any point in uh, 0, 1 can be written in binary uh, expansion as we have done in various examples in the past. So if I were to write the x coordinate as a point a1, a2, a3, etc., all the way the, the, the sequence as long as it is required to infinity, and if I write the y coordinate as b1, b2, b3, etc., also in binary. Uh, so the symbols a and b are either zero or one. Right, so all the A's and B's are 0 and 1 and this is a unique uh, index of each point x, y. Now, if I should write both of them together, the x coordinate in the forward direction and the y coordinate in reverse direction, note that advancing in time is the same as taking this point and shifting it one space uh, to, the, to the right. So if I start with uh, a1, a2, a3, etc., and b1, b2, b3, this, this way, after one iteration, the x coordinate becomes a2, a3, all the way up till ak, whereas the y coordinate becomes a1, b1, b2, b3, etc., going down this way. Now this is a very nice feature of this particular map, and you can see why this happens. Since we are reading the y coordinate in the reverse direction, multiplying x by 2 shifts the point to the right. There is no surprise in that because we know how we have done this before in other examples. Now, what about y? You see, if a1 is 0, then the x coordinate is less than a half. If a1 is 1, the x coordinate is bigger than a half. Now, we also know that if the x coordinate was less than a half, then the y coordinate only gets halved, whereas if the x coordinate was bigger than a half, then the y coordinate gets a halved and you have to add one half to that. That is the uh, point of uh, this algebraic uh, representation over here. Uh, y goes to y by 2 plus 1 half and that depends on whether x was bigger or less than a half. All right. So uh, again, a piece of paper and just working it out and you can convince yourself that this is exactly uh, equivalent to the action of the Baker transformation. You just move your binary point one step to the right to go forward in time. Now, 
This means that we can use symbolic dynamics very effectively in this system, just as we have in earlier cases. And uh, all the points on the square can be written down in this binary representation. And as since the dynamics forward in time just go, uh, you know, is moving the point to the right, going backwards in time is moving the point to the left. And you can immediately infer that there are two fixed points, that is the sequence 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, etc. Because, uh, and they are the end points of the square. If you take this periodic sequence over here, you get a period 2 point, as you would expect, because this periodic sequence is a periodic, is, is a symbol, uh, sequence of uh, length 2. There are, you know, all the things that we have discussed in the case of the Bernoulli map uh, are going to be true over here. There are dense aperiodic orbits. There are many different kinds of periodic orbits. There is, uh, there are uh, sort of all, all the interesting kind of symbolic dynamics can be done in this system. If you were to add dissipation, and the way in which we would do that is to multiply, let us say, the, uh, uh, you, you still go, uh, you increase the x coordinate by a factor of 2, but instead of, uh, instead of halving the original square, you, you multiply it by a factor which is bigger than, uh, sorry, which is less than a half. So, in this particular example over here, this uh, square is stretched out by a factor of 2, but the height is reduced to 0.3 of the original height. So, the area now is 0.6 rather than 1. And when you cut the second half of it and put it back on top, you take care to put it in the upper half. So, now you have the square with two gaps in it essentially. So, at each stage, the volume is reduced by a factor of 0.4. And if you keep doing this successively, uh, you will get an attractor essentially of zero volume. At each stage, therefore, I mean, this is the algebraic version of the uh, mapping. And you just start getting two rectangles at stage 1, 4 at stage 2, double that at stage 3, double that at stage 4, and so on and so forth. And each of these are going to be getting thinner and thinner because they are now getting multiplied by uh, this factor a to the power k. In the limit, the attractor of this dissipative Baker map is actually a set of lines, if I may just draw it over here. Uh, you'll finally, you'll find a whole set of lines that are there, which are just covering the square completely. Uh, if you examine it carefully, it's a canter set in one direction, and of course, the line in the other direction. And uh, in, in the next homework, you'll see, uh, you'll have to cal calculate the box counting dimension of this and show that it is this particular quantity. So, the point uh, of looking at the Baker map is that if you've got a conservative Baker map, we know that the dynamics is as, uh, is can be very, very complicated. It can be just like the Bernoulli system or the tent map or any of those chaotic examples that we have looked at. It is, however, area preserving, uh, so there are no attractors. If you add some dissipation, you get an attractor. And the price that one pays for it is that the volume of this attractor is, of course, zero, and we are not able to do the uh, symbolic dynamics in quite the same way. Nevertheless, this is an important example. Preceding some of these ideas uh, was a very important uh, notion that was introduced by the mathematician Stephen Smale, and it goes under the name of Smale's horseshoe. This is a good example of how stretching and folding can be, uh, can be looked at mathematically. 
Um, and this stretching and folding, as we've been emphasizing, is essential to the formation of chaotic attractors. So this is a model in two dimensions. And uh, again, one starts with a square. Now this square is stretched out into a rectangle that is longer than the original square was, uh, I mean, it's more than twice the length of the original square, and it is uh, shrunk down by a factor. Some of these details are not that important, but the basic, uh, the, the basic idea is the following, that you start with a square, stretch it out, fold it into a U shape, as I've shown over here, this is the horseshoe shape, and then place it back onto the square, right? And we ask for the overlap between the original square and the horseshoe. And then one keeps on doing that over and over again, as one can see over here. Since you've taken the original square, elongated it, shrunk it in one other dimension, and turned it around and put it back, it's interesting to ask whether there are any fixed points or any points that remain inside the square after this operation has been done. And clearly, because this is a map which is onto itself, there must be a fixed point somewhere. So here is a slightly better image of the uh, Smale horseshoe. So here is the original square, all colored green. It's pulled out stretched into a U, a turned, uh, folded into a U and put back onto the original square. And here is the ac action of F again. So this is pulled out twice and uh, again turned around and now you can see how this, uh, the action of, this, of the uh, mapping is when applied twice. Note that this map also has an inverse because the way in which it was stretched out, now you can imagine going backwards in time or one step back and there must have been two vertical strip, strips that when you stretched them out and folded them again would give you exactly this image over here. And here is the map backwards in time, two steps, uh, it, it will now cons consist of uh, of vertical strips over here. So let's just take a step back and note that after I've done the action of the map once, I get two horizontal rectangles over here. Uh, when I apply the map again, I get four horizontal rectangles over here. The pre-image of these two uh, horizontal rectangles, if you like, are these two vertical rectangles over here in yellow. And then two steps back from here will give me four vertical steps and so on. Now, if the area of the square that remains inside the square after application of f is, uh, is lowercase f and the, is, is, is this quantity f over here, uh, you can see that actually f has to be less than 1 because there is a smaller area that is remaining in the, uh, inside the square. So after n iterations, the fraction that would be left is f to the n, and as n goes to infinity, all the points essentially leave the square. So we can ask the question, is the, are there points that never leave, leave the square, and we call that set lambda. Now, if you should ask the detailed question uh, by giving notation over here, so this is the uh, horizontal strip H0, this is the uh, horizontal strip H1. After two steps, this is H00, this is 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. And the reason for these subscripts, you can easily figure out that when I stretch out this original square and fold it around and put it back, the origin of, okay, so this lower part, which is H0, 
This part comes from 8 0 and therefore 8 0 0. This part will come from H 1 and hence H 0 1. And in the same way, but you can figure out since it has been folded over, this is H 1 0 and this is H 1 1. The same logic, a little more pencil and paper work at home. And you can convince yourself that I can give this the notation V0 and V1 for the vertical strips 0 and 1. And their histories will uh, go back in time like so, so that uh, this plus this essentially come from here and this and this come up from uh, the other one over there. All right. Now, where do the points that make up the horizontal strip 8 0 come from? You can look at the inverse of the map and you can see that this must essentially come from V 0 because when I stretch out this to a longer, to a longer uh, uh, rectangle and then flip it over, all the points from here essentially go straight into 8 0. Likewise, all the points from V1 will go into H1. As a matter of fact, I can write, introduce some notation and say that V sub i is just F inverse of H sub i. And going back another step, you see that V i j is the map twice backwards on H i j. So, the set of points that will stay uh, in the square forever can now be deduced by construction. Now, at stage 1 itself, the points that will stay in the future must either be in H 0 or H 1. They must have come from either V 0 or V 1 and therefore, they must lie in this intersection H 0 union H 1 intersection with V 0 union V 1. One step further back, they must lie in the intersection of this union and this union, namely two steps back on both sides. This is forward in time and this is backward in time. Now, I can go back three steps or four steps or n steps and therefore, I will find some long union of strips over here, horizontal strips and long union of uh, vertical strips and their intersection tell me that this set lambda must stay inside this particular intersection. So, here is the intersection for the three, uh, for three iterations. So, you find that there are 64 such squares that lie at the intersection of the green and the yellow. So, all these light colored squares that we see over here, that is where the set lambda uh, must lie. And the set itself, as you can deduce now, is the intersection of a Cantor set of vertical lines and a Cantor set of horizontal lines. And this is just a set of points, which is a Cantor dust. Itself, it has measure 0, but it is an attractor. And any point in this sequence can clearly be specified by a bi-infinite symbol sequence, A0, A1, A2, etc., A minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, etc., where the A k's are either 0 or 1, depending on whether f to the k of x is in h 0 or in h 1. So, depending on whether it comes into the horizontal h 0 or h 1, that is the number of, uh, you know, so that tells you whether these a's are either 0 or 1. The same kind of symbolic dynamics can be done and we have discussed this in the Baker map just now. Uh, so, we keep shifting the point to the right for the future or the left for the past and one can see that the dynamics is going to be really complicated, but we can describe it. There are fixed points 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. 
There are an infinite number of periodic orbits which correspond to periodic sequences of 0 and 1. As a matter of fact, periodic orbits are dense in lambda. The number of periodic orbits will grow exponentially with the period. It's just the number of sequences of uh, two symbols uh, that you can write of, of length n. Uh, this is an invariant set. So once you are in this set, you just stay, you know, under the dynamics, you just keep circulating inside this set. And there are an uncountable number of non-periodic orbits. And furthermore, there are aperiodic orbits that are dense in lambda. So this dynamics is extremely complicated, but there you have a very simple model, the horseshoe, which gives you this dynamics. So why are horseshoes important in the dynamics? The simple answer is that horseshoes are important because they occur all over the place. Uh, and to see that, let's consider a simple linear system, or let's introduce the context via the simple linear system. Uh, x dot is equal to y and y dot is equal to x. Now clearly, 0, 0 is a fixed point. The Jacobian is 0, 1, 1, 0. And the eigenvalues of this characteristic equation, lambda squared minus 1 is equal to 0, they are plus 1 and minus 1, signifying that this fixed point, the origin, is a saddle. So this saddle this is the inward or the inward direction or the stable part of the saddle. This is the unstable direction, so the unstable, uh, the unstable, uh, direct, unstable manifold, the unstable direction, and trajectories are clearly moving away uh, like so except, of course, on these directions, on the eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors which are associated with the eigenvalues plus 1 and minus 1, they lie along the diagonal lines uh, y is equal to x and y is equal to minus x. Now these we term the stable and the unstable manifolds respectively and give them the uh, subscripts u and s. Now, in this linear system, points that are on w u or w s will always remain on these manifolds. Points which are not there, like I already indicated, if a point started from here, then it will flow in this direction, but then it will eventually move out. Whereas a point which is on this manifold has to stay on this manifold and eventually reach the fixed point at an, you know, at infinitely further in the future. This allows us to define the stable manifold of a fixed point or in fact for a periodic orbit is the set of points x such that orbits which start from x approach the fixed point or this periodic orbit as t goes to infinity. Conversely, the unstable manifold is the set of points x such that under time reversal, orbits starting from x will approach the fixed point or the closed curve traced out by the periodic orbit. Or to put it in other words, points on the unstable manifold in the infinite past were at the fixed point. Points on the stable manifold in the infinite future go to the fixed point. Now, for nonlinear systems, these stable and unstable manifolds are not, not the, uh, the straight lines that we see over here because they are only straight very close to the fixed point. Away from the fixed point in a nonlinear system, the manifolds can actually be curved. And when they are curved, one can ask other questions of them because they are no longer constrained to be always orthogonal to one another. So the question one would ask is for nonlinear systems, 
The stable and unstable manifolds are tangential to the linearized dynamics near the fixed point. But away from this linear domain, they, the, these stable and unstable manifolds are curved or can be curved. And if they are curved, the question that arises is, can they intersect? Now, it can be shown, and you should see the textbook for a discussion, for a very nice discussion of this, that stable manifolds cannot intersect stable manifolds, either themselves or others. And unstable manifolds cannot intersect unstable manifolds, either themselves or others. And the basic reason is that the, uh, the uh, dynamics is unique in the phase space. And a point at the intersection will have two different futures. If it is on two, un two stable manifolds, then it has to go to two different fixed points or conversely come from two different fixed points or two different paths. And since you can't have two different futures or two different paths, this is not possible uh, because the, de the deterministic dynamics is unique on, in the phase space. There can, however, be smooth connections between the stable and the unstable manifolds of a single stationary point, and this is called a homoclinic connection, or between the stable and unstable manifolds of different stationary points, which are known as heteroclinic connections. And we will see what they look like. So here is a point O, with, which is in a nonlinear system. This is the stable direction, so here is your stable manifold and here is the unstable manifold. And you can see that the unstable manifold turns around, bends around and then smoothly joins the stable manifold. So a point which in the infinite past was at the fixed point will also come back to the fixed point in the infinite future. So this is your homoclinic connection and in the, the heteroclinic case, here is your point x0. The unstable manifold of x0 smoothly joins the stable manifold of x1 and the stable, unstable manifold of x1 smoothly joins the stable manifold of x0. And there is no contradiction over here because a point over here in the infinite past was at x0, at the infinite future is at x1. And this is actually a very common kind of an example. These are separatrices uh, which separate different kinds of motion. So heteroclinic connections and homoclinic connections are actually quite common. However, stable manifolds can intersect unstable manifolds, right? Cor corresponding to the same or different fixed points. But it comes with a caveat. If they intersect once, they must intersect infinitely often. Here is an example of a homoclinic intersection. So here is the point gamma and the stable manifold of uh, gamma is this direction. Uh, well, here you can see uh, the stable manifold of gamma and the unstable manifold of gamma. So the unstable direction is moving on this side and the stable direction is moving this side. Now O is a point of intersection of the stable and the unstable manifolds. But now you see that O lies both at the fixed point in the infinite past as well as in the infinite future. Imagine that it gets translated in time by one step. If it now reaches this point over here, after one step, it is again at the intersection of the stable manifold and the unstable manifold. If it is now at the intersection of the stable and the unstable manifold again, then its image must also lie on the stable manifold and its image and its image and so on. And the same argument goes true for the past. So now we are stuck with the fact that every 
point of intersection, its image must also lie on the stable manifold and must have lain on the unstable manifold. Uh, and this, since this will only reach the, the uh, fixed point in infinite time, every intersection has got to be repeated uh, infinitely often. The same argument goes uh, for the case of the hetero heteroclinic intersection. Again, if they intersect once, they must intersect infinitely often. These figures are uh, taken from uh, Ott's book and there you can see the discussion based on that. Now, the importance of the homoclinic or the heteroclinic intersection is uh, in this observation of Smail that a homoclinic intersection or a heteroclinic intersection implies a horseshoe type dynamics. So, to see this, let us look at the fixed point P and the homoclinic intersection P prime over here. So, if I have got P and this is my unstable manifold W u marked over here, this is the stable direction W s, right, and I have just smoothed it out to make the, uh, the, um, the horseshoe more evident. Now, as one maps this, take a square z that is that is marked out also over here. As time progresses, z will get stretched out along the unstable direction. It will get pulled out into a longer shape along the uh, unstable direction. And let us say that after some uh, amount of iteration q plus, it becomes this particular rectangle that you see over here like so. The in reverse time, this rectangle z is going to get stretched out along the stable manifold because the stable manifold is defined as all those points that were that in the infinite future are going to be in the uh, at the fixed point. So, in the infinite past, they were really stretched out along the uh, uh, along the stable direction. So, in after uh, q minus steps in the past, the image of z is this long rectangle over here, which I have written down as a. Now, if you look at A, you can see clearly that there is a horseshoe map which is sort of you know, leaping out, over, uh, out of the screen at you because if I take A and map it q minus plus q plus times, that is if I map it so many times, then this long rectangle goes into this horseshoe shaped rectangle and I have got these two points of intersection that have come back to the original rectangle. So, uh, yeah, so that is that is the basic argument of Smale that any homoclinic intersection implies that there is a horseshoe type dynamics and once I have got this horseshoe dynamics for A after so many steps, then I know that in these two regions, I must have points which are periodic with any arbitrary period, there must be dense aperiodic orbits and so on and so forth. Be because once there is a horseshoe in the dynamics, one has all the ingredients for chaotic motion. There must be invariant sets contained in Z, th then these are equivalent to the Bernoulli shift, there must be unstable periodic orbits and so on. Similarly, one can come up with uh, the same argument for the heteroclinic intersection. And uh, as a matter of fact, given the, the kind of image that these have, because the, the motion is so complicated, uh, these are often called homoclinic or heteroclinic tangles. Now, methods to show that a system can have chaotic motion in the first place are typically based on finding saddles in the phase space, identifying their stable and unstable manifolds and then showing that these stable and unstable manifolds, instead of joining smoothly, 
they intersect transversely and therefore there must be a horseshoe in the dynamics and because there is a horseshoe there must be chaos and so on and so forth. For those of you who may be interested in following some of these arguments with a little more detail, there is a very nice exposition uh, of the Smale horseshoe in, this, uh, in an article in a now sadly defunct magazine called Quant. It used to be published in the Soviet, in then Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, it's by Ilyashenko and Kotova. Uh, this was translated into English and in again a sadly short-lived magazine called Quantum. Uh, if you search for it on the net, you will find it uh, in 1995, the May issue. Okay, these are separated by uh, This illustration is from the Quantum magazine. That's it. <laughs>